Good, glorious Sunday morning. It's wonderful to see you in church this morning. It just feels good to be in the house of the Lord, with the people of the Lord, and the presence of the Lord. What a great way to start a week. Um, if you're a visitor, we'd like to have you with us. There's a little card in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that in with uh, your name and your phone number or any other details you'd like to add. Drop it in the offering space in the lobby. As you leave, we'd love to have a record of your visit. And talking about the lobby on the table outside is a whole pile of these. Uh, an informative little newspaper. And the important thing about it, it tells you why you should vote yes for Second Amendment 2 in the Kentucky Constitution in the election. I recommend you grab a copy as you leave. Also on the same table in the lobby are a welcome wagon visit. If you're a member here, grab one and go and visit somebody who's just moved to our area, invite them to church. And if you uh, like, want to participate in gospel outreach, we have gospel blitz next Saturday uh, here in Georgetown. Meet at the church at 10 a.m. Don't put out door hangers. And if that's not enough, on Tuesday night we have neighborhood evangelism. Yes, it's my favorite thing. So if you'd like to participate in that, come and join us here at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night. Other things coming up, uh, this informative little pamphlet, if you have one and you open it up, you'll see it's packed with all kinds of information. Council's meeting, that's the people who count the money that uh, we donate to the church. Uh, after the evening service, then teen boys Bible study today at the Christian's home from 12.30 to 2 p.m. They're studying the life of Joseph. And there's a teen activity on September the 27th, basketball at Alpha Training Center. Uh, next Saturday, oh no, October the 8th, uh, men's prayer breakfast. Invite Jared to church. If you're a man or a boy, or anything in between, uh, you are welcome to come to that uh, prayer breakfast. The food is great. The fellowship is wonderful. You'll have a good time, and your spirit will be blessed. There's an international dinner coming up on October the 15th, um, 5 p.m. here at the church. Uh, it's our missions. October is always our missions emphasis month. Uh, that weekend is our uh, emphasis for the week. You'll have one of our missionaries with us, and um, we'd like to be a blessing to them. The international dinner is always a lot of fun. Uh, if you'd like to contribute uh, towards a small gift for our missionaries, um, just drop a check in the offering plate, mark it clearly, for mission, or for uh, 6SIXT is their name, and uh, we'll gather that and then let them have a gift when they share. Uh, what else is happening? Woman for Christ, Thursday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Beginning one of our life stages, October the 22nd, we're going to Salaka Wildlife Center, uh, and the time is yet to be decided. And speaking of life stages, um, this weekend, Friday and Saturday night, in a 24 hour stretch, Pastor and Jessica Fannin, our pastor and his dear wife, hosted 88 of you at their home. Uh, they do this almost every weekend, not 88. I mean, that's like a record number. Was in 2012, that was our total church congregation. Uh, and now it was just two groups in our church. We went to their home, and uh, they were blessing to us, our pastor and his wife. They're always entertaining people at their home. It's like Grand Central Station, and uh, probably most of you have already been to visit them there. New Grass 101, that's a class to teach you our history, why we're here, what we believe in. Uh, starts on October 23rd through November the 6th. About 15 families have signed up for this one. If you're interested in doing that, please let Kathy Marshall know, and she'll make sure that you do get signed up. I think those are all our um, announcements. Last one is to remind you about the church library. Room 2, down the corridor, here are lots of books to suit every taste and interest. All right, the announcements are all done. We're going to turn our minds, our hearts, to the things of the Lord, by, and we're going to begin by reading a passage of Scripture. 
And then you'll meditate on that for a moment and open in prayer. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the sea, and established it upon the flood. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy faith, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's meditate on that for a moment and then we'll open in prayer. Father in heaven, you are indeed the King of glory, the King of blessing, the King of holiness, the King of righteousness, a God and a Savior who loves us and blesses us more than we could possibly deserve. We thank you so much for the bounty of your many gifts for this place where we can gather each week. We thank you for your goodness and kindness towards us. We ask only, Lord, that you would be worthy of your great blessings, particularly in our daily lives when we go out into the community. Let them know that there is a God who loves them, a God who wants to save them, as they see your glory in us. Please bless us this morning once again as we teach on your word and raise our voices in worship. And in everything we do, may the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, be exalted. Amen. All throughout Scripture, it's told to us that worship is a result of being convinced of the truth of God's Word in our hearts and our lives. Uh, let us go ahead and do that together this morning uh, in obedience and in love. We're going to begin by singing, Praise You, the Lord, the Almighty. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth. Let's stay at the same. second verse paints a vast picture of who our God is. It's, we understand that He is Almighty, He is the King of creation, and the second verse continues, He for all things wondrously reigneth. But it continues and says that we're sheltered under His wings, and He gently sustains us. It says later that He's even taking care of desires that we have. It's wonderful to think that we have a God who is in control of all things, and He cares even for our, our little desires and wants that we may have. Let's sing out on that second verse.
may be seated. Uh, before our next song, Sarah is going to come play her violin. Uh, the familiar text that we're familiar with, familiar, very familiar with, uh, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Uh, she's going to play that old text, but there's a different tune, an alternate to what we're maybe familiar with, but I think it does a good job in painting her majesty of God. Listen as she plays. The song that we started learning uh, last year was In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Uh, it may be unfamiliar to some of you, so if you need, uh, please turn to 123 in your hymn books. But let's stand and we'll sing the first, second, and third stanzas of In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
our final song, we'll, learn, we'll continue singing our hymn of the month, God's Love Never Fails. sing that third verse, uh, I, I do regret that we haven't taken more time to notice the words of the song uh, throughout this month, but that third verse in particular is important, I think. It says, God's love will prevail though sin seems strong, which it does very often in our lives. But he continues, because that's not the end of the picture. He says, by God's sacrifice, sin's chains are gone. Uh, we can be very thankful for our God that loves us enough to overlook even our faults and failures if we'll just come to him in repentance. Let's sing out on that third verse. singing indeed. I had to sing out on the third stanza. I couldn't hear myself sing because Olivia was singing so well. Olivia, you knocked it out of the park there on the front row. Praise the Lord. Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter number 3 this morning. Continuing our series of our superior Savior. We did very much enjoy having two life stages over on Friday and Saturday night. I think the only thing we would do in reverse is have the younger ones over on Friday night. That group last night was about 55 people, a lot of kids. The bonfire was on Saturday night a lot like this. Don't go near it. Be careful. It's hot. Don't go near it. Um, on Friday night with the navigators, with the teenagers, it was, I don't know, whatever, you know, <clears throat> You're smart enough, don't go near the fire. Uh, but uh, had a great time with both groups. About 30 or so in the Friday night crowd, about 50, 55 in the Saturday night crowd. And it was, I was talking to Chris Graham before the early service this morning, it wasn't until about 2012 that the church eclipsed 90 people in attendance uh, at, uh, overall. And so it was nice to have just two of our seven or eight life stages over and had almost 90 people there. Uh, it was a nice, nice time together with everyone. And Jess and I are not tired, but we're not as energetic today as we were before we started about 5 o'clock on Friday. So I am glad Shane is teaching tonight, and so I can sit and be recuperating and listening. Hope you'll be back for that as well. Hebrews chapter 3 as we continue in our series. 
We'll read the first six verses, then we'll jump in and look at the whole chapter this morning. The Bible says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm, until the end. Father, this morning as we come to you, I pray that the truth of this passage would help us understand who you are and who you ought to be in our lives. Having studied in the first two chapters your person and your purpose, we now come to understand what you ought to be to us every single day of our lives, the preeminence that Christ must have. The writer of Hebrews is not writing individual chapters for us to learn, but he's writing a letter, a book, for us to study and to know. We do well to listen to chapter 3 this morning. Lord, as we have sung about our Almighty God and King, and your love that never fails, and we've heard the thousand tongues that sing of my Redeemer's name, Think of that fourth stanza, even of that song, where the deaf, the dumb, and the blind are healed when they come to Jesus Christ. That is His position. Lord, I pray that You would help us this morning. As we heard in the psalm, to open our worship, who is the King of glory? Twice that question is asked by the psalmist there. And before each of those, he tells us that we are to lift up our heads. We are to look on high. Your preeminent position is what we study today. May we understand who Christ is and what he must be in each of our lives. Bless us in this hour, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We come this morning to look at Christ's preeminent position in the lives of those who believe in Jesus Christ. That is our study. In his position, we would say. What is the superiority of Christ? When we study chapter 1, He is superior in His person. Jesus Christ is far better than the angels, for He is God in the flesh. In chapter 2 of Hebrews, we studied that He is superior in His purpose. He came and accomplished what God had intended for Him to accomplish, because He is God. What God meant to do for mankind is redeem us from our sins, and Jesus accomplished that. Well, we come this morning now to study who He is in His position. If we know Christ, then we know the preeminence that He has. Christ must be positioned at the very top of all of our ambitions and all of our plans. In Hebrews chapters 3 through chapter 8, we're going to find an explanation, really a profound explanation throughout the Old Testament's typology All the things that were mysteries and shadows in the Old Testament come to fruition in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we're going to find that the position He has is very important. Just like we'll study next week in chapter 4, the promise that He gives is equally important. You cannot enter rest, which is what chapter 4 is about, without understanding who Christ is and the preeminence, the chief place in our lives. That he must have. Instead of preeminence, often Christ is subordinate in our life. That's the opposite of preeminence. It means he's just a piece of our life. He's just a part of who we are. And the writer here is saying to us, no, that's not true at all. In fact, he uses the word wherefore. If you look in verse number one, he starts with wherefore. Now, if you're an astute reader, you will know that from chapter two, he started with the word therefore. And with chapter three, he starts with the word wherefore. Are there any grammarians in here that could tell me the difference between therefore and wherefore? And of course, the spelling is, the the answer is the spelling, right? That's that's what it is. It's the spelling, and the answer is no. The word therefore in the original language is the word dia. It means the reason something is done. I do this 
because of what happened before. This has happened, therefore I'm going to do this. The word wherefore comes from the word hope, and it means from whence something comes. It, it speaks of its nature. Now, most of the time in here, I appeal to our science nerds. But not today. Today, all of you thespians, and yes, that's a word we can still use in public, all you Shakespeare lovers out there can rejoice when we come to this word wherefore. The only line most of us remember from Romeo and Juliet is what? Romeo! Romeo! Wherefore art thou? Romeo. Now, most of us, when we were in high school and in literature class, we took that to mean he must be somewhere in the garden and she can't find him. But that is not at all, if you are a Shakespearean, what that line means. In fact, an understanding of that from Shakespeare, Elizabethan English, will help us to understand this wherefore. In that statement, Juliet is not asking where Romeo is physically. She is asking, from whence do you come, Romeo? If you understand what Shakespeare is writing about in their two families, they were warring families who were at odds with each other. There was open hostility and a union between Romeo, a Capulet, and, or excuse me, a Juliet, a, a Capulet, and Romeo, a Montague, could not take place. And so from her position, she says, Wherefore art thou, Romeo? It's interesting, in the very next line, She's hoping and asking that he is not a Montague. She says this in the next line, Deny thy father and refuse thy name. She's not talking about where he is physically. She's talking from whence he comes. She later says in the same verse, What Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any part, well, nor, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. And then she concludes by saying, what's in a name? She's asking in her wherefores from whence or what family he comes. By the way, the writer of Hebrews is not Shakespearean, but he's writing the same thing. He's saying because of who Christ is in his person, because of what Christ accomplished in his purpose, we can understand his position and from whence we are called Holy brethren and partakers in verse 1 of this heavenly calling. From whence do we come? From whence do we get that calling? From whence do we have this brotherhood of holy nature? It is from the person and purpose of Jesus Christ. And so he begins by telling us, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of this heavenly calling, Consider the Apostle and High Priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Our wherefore points us back from whence we claim our adoption and our calling in Hebrews uh, 3 and verse 1. That claim flows from Christ's superior position. It comes because of His superior person and purpose. By faith, we believers are to position Christ as preeminent in our life because He is both our Creator and our Savior. He is our Redeemer and friend. And so in our notes this morning, we study verses 1 through 6 and verses 7 through 19 as two separate positions. Christ's superior position is to first challenge us in our notes. Because Jesus is who he claimed to be, there ought to be a rightful place or position that he assumes in our life, that he takes in our life. Christ challenges us to develop our understanding of him through the writer's words here. He wants our full attention. The writer challenges us, letter A, to consider him in verse number one. When was the last time you sat down, not on a Sunday morning, not in here while I'm preaching, not when we're reading the Bible or singing hymns, when was the last time in your week you sat down and just took time to contemplatively, meditatively consider who Jesus Christ is? It's been a busy week, Pastor. Oh, I trust me, I know. 
Well, you're a pastor. I mean, you get all day. All you do is sit behind your desk and read the Bible. I get extra time to read the Bible that you don't get. Yes, that is the privilege of being called into the pastor. I will not deny that. But it doesn't exempt me from my own personal Bible study and my own reflection and meditation of who Christ is in my life. Friend, if I don't get it straight, there's no way that I can sit here and preach to you how you should be able to get it straight. So equally, all of us need to come to the reality of the position that Christ ought to have in our life. And so he starts by telling us, or giving us a challenge, and that challenge is, please consider who Jesus Christ is. We consider Christ in two ways in these first six verses. By what he brings and by what he built. By what he brings and by what he built. First in your notes there under letter A, consider what Christ brought when he came to this earth. What did he bring? Well, he gives it to us in verse number one, doesn't he? Christ is the apostle of our profession. Anybody want to stand up and venture what that means? Anybody want to take my position? I mean, trust me, sometimes you think it's easy getting up here and preaching. There are some of these phrases that take deep dives into the truth of the Word of God. An apostle is an eyewitness. They give an account of what they know, what they've heard, and what they've experienced. The apostle, Peter, walked with Jesus, knew Jesus, and then went out and told others of Jesus. Thus, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Why do we call Jesus Christ an apostle here? Why did the writer call him an apostle? The answer I put underneath this note is that he brought the message of divine redemption as the apostle of our profession. In other words, in heaven there was a foundational plan set before the world began. God did not hope that man would sin, but he knew that man would sin. And in man's sin, God had a pre-packaged, already planned process of redeeming us back from that sin. And in that, Jesus Christ came to deliver that message as the apostle from heaven for our hope and help. That's how he, how he is the apostle of our profession. He came and brought a divine message of redemption. So how is he then our high priest? And the answer is the high priest did not bring God's message to man. The high priest would take man's sacrifice to whom? God. He was the one that entered into the Holy of Holies. He was the one that had the bells around his ankle and around the bottom, or the rope around his ankle and the bell around the hem of the bottom of his garment. And if they stopped jangling, they started pulling because he entered into God's presence in the Old Testament with sin in his heart. He was struck dead immediately because no sin comes into God's presence. But he went in with the blood on his fingertips and on his ear. And as he went in with the blood sacrifice to pour upon the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies on that high day of atonement, as he entered into that place, he was bringing man's petition and sacrifice back to God. So the writer of Hebrews says, look, you better consider what Christ brought to you. He brought to you a message of divine redemption, and he brings back to God the means of our redemption as our high priest. That is a wonderful introduction to his position. It's a wonderful introduction to knowing your Savior in a better way day by day. The Word of God is living. It brings us the hope of salvation's message. Jesus Christ, the Logos, is that message of divine redemption. The challenge begins for us to consider Him. How are we to consider Him? The writer says we are to consider Him in the fact of redemption. He both brings the message and then takes the means of our redemption, His own blood, back before His Father in heaven. We're also to consider number two there in your notes, what Christ built. This is an interesting one. The writer of Hebrews is going to pivot, and he's going to pivot in comparison the position of Moses. Now, remember his audience. Both believing Jews who were tempted to regress back into Judaism, or Jews who were still practicing Judaism, who were very intrigued by this new thing in this person, man, called Jesus Christ. What was it? And so what he does is he presents Moses. And he presents Christ in comparison to Moses. It is interesting as we read, the Bible says this in verse number 5. Moses barely was faithful in all his house as a servant. Well, why was, why was he faithful in his house? Or how was he faithful? In the sense of his faithfulness, we find 
It was for a testimony of those things which were to be, were to be spoken of after. Moses served as an example. Is what he, said. he was a witness. He was a testimony. So we find first in the building that Christ has, God first began by building a house for servants. I put that in your notes, I believe. It's on there. It says he built a house for servants. Moses is a servant. By the way, we have to understand this word servant here. Some people that I've met within the Christian faith will say, look, I would just be happy to be a servant of God. That's a commendable statement. I think I understand the heart of a person that says that. But what we're considering this morning is the difference between being a servant and being a son. God, in Moses, in the law, had built a house. That house could only condemn mankind to a life without hope. We are all guilty. We all fall short of God's glory. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 23 tell us. All of sinning comes short of His glory. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. There is no way in the house of Moses, as servants, we can ever have a relationship with Him. We are merely servants. It is also an interesting thing. The word servant here, this is the only time the word servant is used in the original language this way. It is the word therapon. Now, what does that sound like? Therapon. Sounds like therapy. Moses probably in heaven was giggling a little bit when the writer of Hebrews wrote that, yeah, I gave Israel a whole lot of therapy. They were nothing but a pain in my side the entire time I led that group. They were problems from Jump Street. We use, in the Bible, there's a word for a bond slave, and it's a doulos. It's somebody who is committed because they have a debt and they have to serve. That is not this word, servant. Moses was not indebted to do this. Moses was called to do this. Moses was requested to do this. Moses was chosen to do this. In other words, the writer of Hebrews here is not tearing down another position to build up Jesus Christ. He's actually venerating Moses. He's not denigrating him. He's lifting him up. He's saying, Moses was great therapy to you, Israel. He was a great helper to you, Israel. But he wasn't your healer. He's only one that's your healer, and that's Jesus Christ. These two houses, every human being that's ever been born falls into the first house. We are guilty under the law of God given by the hand of Moses. That is that house. Using this word, Therapon, for servant for Moses, the writer is not denigrating him. In fact, I believe the writer of Hebrews is thanking Moses. Moses did his helpful, therapeutic work within the structure and framework of the law that God had given. And what the writer of Hebrews is doing is showing the superior position to Christ because Christ came by grace, whereas Moses came by the law. The law could just tell you how bad you were. Jesus Christ can tell you how much you're loved by the grace of God. What a wonderful truth. Moses, I put in my notes here, could only give therapy. He could not give a remedy. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone could give a remedy. And so when we read these verses, it says, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. This man being Jesus Christ in the flesh, in his purpose and his person from chapters 2 and chapter 1. Inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house or the superstructure of what we believe or what we live under. You Hebrews want to keep living under your religious works. They will not do anything for you. But Jesus Christ will do everything for you. That's why he goes on in verse 6, but Christ as a son, not a servant, as a son over his own house. In other words, he built his own house. And we just learned from verse number 4, he that built all things is God. Jesus is God because he built his own house. And that house is a house of grace. A house built on and by the grace of God that we by faith accept or receive. God built a house for servants, I put in your notes, but Christ built a house for sons. And if you have not left the house of servants and entered into the house of sons by faith in the grace of Jesus Christ, you are not saved this morning. You say, prove it to me. I will. Just hang in there. The writer's going to give all of this to us this morning. Still, he's challenging us. We noted first, then, the challenge to us is to consider him. What do you think of Jesus Christ and what he brought to you in divine redemption? 
What do you think of Jesus Christ and what He has built for you? And the ability to move from servanthood to son and heir with Jesus Christ. Well, He gives us one other thought in challenging us in these first six verses, and that is to commit to Him. Once we have considered who Christ is in our daily thinking, we're to commit to Him. God never makes us believe in Him. He says to us, we're free will beings. Now, if I were God, I would not have made my creation that way. I would have wanted that creation to always obey me and always please me and always make me happy. But thankfully, I'm not God. He is far wiser and far greater than I could ever hope to be, than any of us collectively could ever be. And so he's given us free will. Part of God's design for mankind is that we would freely choose to love and accept him. That we would freely choose to obey and come to him. Christ's position, as we're studying this morning, of God in the flesh, as both the apostle and high priest, challenges us to commit to him by faith. Because the choice is ultimately ours. That's what he says at the end of verse number 6. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, Firm unto the end. So let's explore this idea first of being sons. We're to commit to him as sons, not just as servants. Every human being that's ever lived, believing or unbelieving, has served their purpose. You say, well, the unbelieving have gone off into the grave and into hell, and they're reserved for judgment in the afterlife at the second death. And the answer is, they will still serve their purpose. What is man's purpose? To glorify God. Those who freely rejected or had never received the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but have passed from this life without accepting Him as their Savior, the Bible says, not Kyle says, the Bible says, hell is their existence. And God in His glory is honored in that because man as a race chose to forsake God. That's hard for us to stomach. That's hard for us to understand. That's hard for us sometimes to accept. But it is equally so of faith. Every human being will serve their purpose, but every son will know the relationship that is rightfully theirs. As we explore this idea of what we're committing to in entering the household of Christ, it is worthy of our study. What are the differences between a helping servant and an heir? And by the way, I put it within the category of a helping servant because Moses was a helping servant. He lived his whole life in faith, adhering to the dispensation or the stewardship that God had given to him. And that was the law. He was faithful in it. That's why when the Mount of Transfiguration comes, Moses is there with Elijah talking with Jesus in that place. Because Moses had run his race well in what he had known. But he was merely a servant. We, in this age, we're sons, we're daughters of God through Jesus Christ. What is the difference? A servant does not know the why. Often, a servant only knows the how. Go do this. Bring in the crops. Take care of the house. Do this. A servant only knows the how. I want you to go and do this. Well, why do I have to do that? You're the servant. I'm the master. You don't have the right to know. But a son has the right to know the why. Because someday, as an heir, they're going to take possession of all things. And so the father, for me as a father of three boys... I often, especially as they get older, I do not just say to them, well, good luck. <laughs> you figured it out. Let me, kind of dad what I be. No, he's my son. I'm going to sit with my son and I'm going to say, well, this is why. But sometimes my kids probably are like, dad, you're over and explain it. But I want them to know the why because they're my son. They're the heir to the fan and name, if you want to say it that way. They're the heir to your family's name, your children are. And so as sons and daughters, we want them to know the why. And that is the beautiful reality of becoming the sons of God. We understand why he does what he does. We understand what he asks. The son in relation to his family will be taught both the how and the why. Sonship, therefore, is far superior to servanthood and what it could ever be. Jesus Christ, as God in the flesh, is also the Son. That's what it says at the beginning of verse 6. But Christ as a Son over His own house. Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. 
Recently on Sunday nights, I preached through the book of Galatians, and I think it explains far better than I ever could the simple process of how we become the sons of God. And what the writer here is saying to us of the position of Jesus Christ and then our placement within His position as the Son of God. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 says this, For ye are all the children of God, how? Finish it for me. Now, go full circle. But the Swedish shepherd here, the Charlie Brown teacher, you are all children of God by faith, in Christ Jesus. So how do you become a son moving from just a servant? And the answer is, by faith in Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, the way you become a son or a daughter of God, the way you move into a relationship with Almighty God, is by faith in Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, just a few verses after that, it says this, Now I say, that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant. Pause for a second. Aha! I got you. No, no. As he's a child. The word child here says it means immature. As you have not grown up in your faith, as you have not recognized the position of Jesus Christ in your life, what he actually did for you when he came and died for you. If you don't preeminently place Christ in your own life, you are going to stay a mere child, and you will have no difference between that and a servant. You want to know why there's so many miserable Christians today? It's because they never grow up. They just have to always be told what to do. Pastor, I came in this morning. I want you to tell me what to do, please. I I can't do that. I mean, I can tell you what's right and I can tell you what's wrong. But you're a son or a daughter of God through Jesus Christ by faith in Him. You should know how to do the things that you should do. You should be following Him. You differ nothing from the servant, though... He be Lord of all, but it is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Until the Father recognizes your maturity, you are going to constantly stay in a state as a son of God, like you are a servant. There's not going to be anything that really differentiates you. Thankfully, in verses 4 and 5 in Galatians, he goes on and says this, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. The reality is yours, but you have to act upon it. That leads us to our second thought here under letter B, and that is this. I'm to commit to him by seizing versus the separation. Number two, we seize or we are separated. You say, where do you get that? Well, the phrase hold fast the confidence. The word hold fast literally means to grasp and to not let go. It has the idea of seizing and controlling. Seizing and taking into ourselves. It means to bring it in unto ourselves. The word if is a very interesting word. Sometimes in the New Testament, the word if means since. Since we've done this, this is going to happen. It's an if-then statement. So since this, then this. This is not that kind of a statement. This is a conditioned participle here. It literally means it is your choice to make. If you don't lay hold on the confidence of who Jesus Christ is, if you don't lay hold on the rejoicing hope, then you, friend, are not going to be one of his sons. If you don't make that commitment, it's not on the pastor, it's not on the church, it's not on your parents, it's on you. We are not automatically in the household of Christ. All of mankind technically is in the household of Moses because the law condemns us. We find here there is a conditional seizing that we have. It is conditioned upon our seizing upon the belief. What are we to believe? The confidence and rejoicing hope that Christ is who he says he is. The word confidence in verse number 6 is interesting as well. It means the unambiguous nature. Remember, he's writing to religious Jews who are are struggling. He says, we lay hold, we seize the confidence or the truth. We seize what we know to be true. Jesus Christ is unambiguously true. He is writing here. You have to lay hold of that truth. He is telling them to break away from their Judaism, break away from their religious thinking. 
that their actions or their acts would save them. Nothing will save them but Jesus Christ. That is the rejoicing hope we have. The antithesis to seizing is separating. If we do not lay hold or hold fast to confidence, it leads us to be separated from Christ. In other words, the writer is telling us you have your whole life to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. But if you fail to grasp that by faith, God's gracious gift of of salvation, His offer of salvation, if you fail to lay hold on that, then you will be separated from Him eternally. Let me say one additional note to believers here this morning on this thing. Because while he's talking about this, his general audience, his particular audience, I should say, is us, believers. He is giving us truth that if we don't seize our salvation, we don't take the gift of salvation into ourselves personally, we will be separated from God. But he also is talking to us in our salvation. Paul encouraging his son in the faith, Timothy, who had put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, told him to lay hold upon eternal life. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12, Paul says this, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. That is the same phrasing as hold fast. Lay hold on eternal life. In other words, seize it, grab it, hold it, don't let it go. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called. And hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. He, witnesses. He's saying to Timothy, Timothy, you've made a positive profession of faith. Now, go live in the fullness of that life. And we have so many Christians that don't live like Christians today. We have so many Christians that just play the game, act it out. What he is saying to Timothy, and it's echoing what the writer of Hebrews is saying to the believing Jews who were tempted to go back into Judaism or believe parts of it. He is saying to Timothy there, this means that we are to put our spiritual selves into holy living out the holy life. It's full surrender. It's total submission to the life that God has designed for us. Let me say something. It is a wonderful life. If you wholly surrender to God, you will never regret it. But I know that as a pastor, when I preach in the early service, when I preach in this service, sometimes even when I preach in the evening service or the Wednesday service, There is a small group, or sometimes even a large group, maybe it's been a rotten week, and you say, I don't know, Pastor, if selling out to the Lord is really what I want to do. Listen, you're always going to be a dissatisfied Christian if I tell you this. You've come to Jesus Christ by faith. Why wouldn't you live holy for Him by faith? Christ's superior position challenges us to consider Him and to commit to Him. In verse number 7, the writer moves on then to show Christ's position to charge us. The second wherefore in the chapter comes up. Now, we don't need to rehash Romeo and Juliet. We know it means from when. Wherefore, from when. Now, there's a long parenthetical statement that comes next. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. What is the difference between a challenge and a charge? To challenge you, I might say, you should live holy for Jesus Christ, but I can't make you. To charge you is very similar to our thinking of a courtroom setting. If you lose that courtroom setting, you are a convict. You've been charged. There's a demand in it. The idea of a challenge is to call someone to take part in something willfully. A charge is a demand upon them that if you don't do this, it will not go well for you. Parents know that. Sometimes we challenge our kids. And sometimes we charge our kids. That's part of being a good parent. What does he charge us with? Well, letter A, we are charged not to harden ourselves. If Christ is preeminent, if he has the first place in our life, if he is positioned high and lifted up, if he is the king of glory, as the psalmist said this morning in our reading, if he is who we believe him to be, then we will never want to harden our heart to Him because He's the King of glory. After the word wherefore, all the way down through verse 11, it's a parenthetical statement. Now, to the grammarians in here, what does a parenthetical statement mean? Well, it means the sentence is complete with 
or without the statement in the parentheses. But the parenthetical statement is given to add context and meaning. We have a frame of reference, if you will. The reason for this parenthetical statement that is found in this passage, or the way it's found its way into this passage by the writer's hand and by God's mind, is because God wanted us to understand the context of what letter B will be. And I can't give it to you yet because I'm not ready to preach it yet. Israel had hardened their heart. Let's read the verses. Wherefore? Now we start the parenthesis. And it's a whole sentence, by the way. He even puts a period in here. This is a whole thought, just parenthetical. As the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the day, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. So I swear, God is speaking here. This is directly from the books, a uh, book of Exodus and, and Deuter, or, excuse me, the book of Exodus and Numbers. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. This is also a direct quote of Psalm 95. As we understand it, then what he's saying in the parentheses is, "Do not harden yourself to my word when it's preached." If Christ is high and lifted up in your mind, if He is preeminent in your life, then when the Bible is preached, you go, "Pay attention." Why else would you waste an hour on a Sunday morning being here? Well, I mean, you say it like that, you just have to get up and leave. I hope you don't. I hope you're as serious about the Christian life as I hope you are, and that you hope I am. I put in your notes there a very simple statement: Don't be like Israel. Uh, that's what the whole parenthetical statement is about: how they provoked God and to one another in the in the wilderness. Israel hardened their heart when truth was right in front of them. When truth was all around them, when truth was working on their benefit, on their behalf, in their very existence and livelihood, they rejected the placement of priority or preeminence to the truth or God manifesting himself to them. And we as believers in the New Testament age do the same thing to Jesus Christ. Day after day. Rather than bringing preeminent in our every thought, he's subordinate in an afterthought. They do not value the position that Christ has and that Christ is actually in. The writer is writing this to the Israelites who, in response to Christ, are hardening their hearts to Him. If they had done an honest assessment of who God was, and these Hebrews in particular that were the recipients of this letter, who Christ was, and what Christ did when He walked this earth for Israel in human flesh, they would have immediately believed like that. But they weren't giving Him His proper place or position. It brings us to our second thought, and that begins in verse number 12 to the end of the chapter. We must pick up our wherefore, however, because that's what it's there for. Right? That's what an old pastor teacher taught me when I was a kid. When you see a wherefore, see what it's there for, and that's what we're doing. The wherefore starts the thought. Parenthetically, we understand that we're not to harden our heart, but the letter B, we are charged now in the present to heed him. We're to listen to Him. To obey Him. We could read literally verses 7 and verse 12 together. Wherefore, take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you, and in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now stop. The first wherefore talked about holy brethren. Here he's talking about believing brethren. They're the same brethren, but he's saying, from whence you come, his person and his purpose help us to understand our challenge. His person and his purpose help us understand our charge as well. And what is that charge? Listen and obey. Immediately. If Christ is preeminent, it's not a problem. If Christ is subordinate, he's just one of the other categories of factors in our life that help us make decisions, then we're not always going to obey because it's not convenient. You don't like it. The brethren here is written to Jewish brethren who have been in the household of Moses, but either have not yet come to faith in Jesus Christ or had come to faith in Jesus Christ and were willing, wanting, and ready to go back into the old lifestyle. Heeding God's revelation, His Word, is the pathway to success. Hardening to His Word 
the pathway to destruction and defeat. I ask the question here, those who were in the wilderness, were they saved? Now, that's a dispensational question, I understand. Were they saved in the way that we are? No. Were they saved? Yes, because they had participated in the Passover. Right? It was the Passover, putting the blood on the doorpost. And as they as the death angel came, they passed over them. And they went out, the Bible says in the book of Exodus, with a high hand, with power, with authority, because they had been saved from the world. They had been saved from Egypt. It's no different for us. And so as they departed, they were going out. But he says to them, you will not enter into our rest. And, and I wish I could preach all of Hebrews to you this morning. You're like, oh, good luck you are. I'm, I'm not, I promise, right? I wish I could go on to chapter 4. If you'll come back next week, it'll even get more intriguing. Because the position of Christ can only bring them the promise. What does God promise those who trust Him? Chapter 4, you'll find this word over and over. Read it this week in anticipation. Rest. 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 And you might say, my life is a mess. 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 It has no rest, rest, rest. The answer is because you haven't placed Christ where he needs to be. He doesn't have a preeminent position in your life. He's just part of it. God says, I have no interest in just being a part of you. I didn't come in the flesh, in person. I didn't come and accomplish what I did with my purpose to just have a part of your life. To show up on Sunday. To get a, a pal around with your gal pals or your guy pals or whatever other pals you might have. To listen to a Sunday school teacher or to put your kids in a Sunday school class. That's not what God is interested in. He's interested in all of you. And when He has all of you, Christ is in His right place. Our responsibility, according to verse 12, is to exhort one another to heed God's word. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Excuse me, verse thirteen. In departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Look, Jeremiah said, "Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it?" And the answer is only God. But your heart will assault you. Your heart will deceive you. Your heart will want to harden against what God's Word says. And He says, now, today, right now, obey He what the Bible is teaching. Obey God. Obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Hebrews chapter 4, the very next chapter. These chapters aren't in isolation. It's not like you drop in and go, hey, new thought, new idea. They're all built upon each other. In the very next chapter, he's going to say that the Word of God is sharp and powerful, and it divides the joint and the marrow, and it separates even the, the spirit and the soul of man. That statement is the key in that verse, because it separates what we think and what we feel. The Bible literally intercepts that connection where it's like, well, I feel this way, so I think this way, and I'm going to act this way. And God says, no, my word will give you the rest that you need. I promise it will if you will just let it come into your life. Divide what you feel from what you think. Think right, and your feelings will come along. But none of that happens if Christ isn't placed in his right position. To those who have yet to trust Jesus Christ, may I say this morning, heed the calling of the Spirit of God to salvation. Throw off your unbelief. Or you will be like verse 19. If we were to continue reading, here's what we find in verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some who, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Who's he talking about there, by the way? Two people. Joshua and Caleb. That's it. I mean, when we read that, we're like, well, maybe there was a group of 10 or 30 or 100 or 1,000. I mean, potentially there were 6 million of them that left in the Exodus. And so you're saying all 5,999,998 people died in the wilderness except for Joshua and Caleb? I'm not saying that. God said that. But I agree with him, yes. And so he says, hey, how be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses? But with whom was he grieved for you? Was it those two or the rest of them? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? By the way, they didn't lose their salvation. They just never entered into victory. The promised land is not glory in heaven. The promised land is you living as a winner, as a Christian right now, living victoriously. 
These people were always discouraged believers because they complained against Moses, they complained against God, and they never lived in victory. Does that sound like you this morning? If so, you've not placed Christ where he needs to be. He's not preeminent in your life. May it never be said of any of our lives what it says in verse number verse 19. So we see that they could not enter, enter where? Enter into that rest, enter into that promised land. They could not enter because of unbelief. In closing this morning, Christ is superior in his position to Moses. To the reader as a Jew, a Hebrew, that would have been a shocking statement. It's not to us. As believers of this age, we understand Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. So what should we take away from Hebrews 3? And here it is. That the preeminent position of Christ should both challenge us how to consider Him and to commit our ways to Him daily and charge us to live and be different. When we hear preaching that convicts us, respond. Don't let the deceitfulness of your own heart, your own feeling, your own distraction take you away into disobedience to the Word of God. Not the disobedience to count. Not one of you has ever disobeyed me. You disobey against God and God only. He's the one with whom you have to do, the Bible says. His preeminence challenges us to consider and commit to Him. His preeminence charges us as sons to seize upon the salvation and sanctification that He offers us. So what is Christ's position in your life this morning? Is He preeminent? Or is He subordinate? Is He just a part of your life? Say, well, I mean, I'm not a pastor. Listen, if only the pastor lived sold out to God, we're a miserable people. I'll be no different than Moses in the wilderness. Who do I have to go help now? You say, well, isn't that your job? I'm glad to do that job, just like Moses said. I want to be faithful in my therapy. But as sons of God, you have the right to walk with Him. The way that you do that is to always wake up every morning and say, God, you are first place today. You are the first in all of my thinking and all of my actions. His person and His purpose in our lives demands that we give Him the preeminent position in everything that we are. If you believe that, you'll be a happy Christian. You'll enter into the promise that we'll study next week. If you don't believe that or don't do that, you will be a miserable Christian if you're one of us. Father, help us as we close our thoughts. May we understand who Jesus is. The writer of Hebrews has done a wonderful job of laying out a compelling argument. Simple facts that we can believe. Jesus came in the flesh. The personhood of God the Son. Divine and human, chapter 1. The purpose of Jesus Christ to pay for our sins, to bring redemption's plan to fruition. Chapter 2. And now we are drawn to the point of whether we will make Christ preeminent in our very life. This letter in its 13 chapters can wholly transform us as a people if we will heed it. That's why the second wherefore is placed in this chapter. Wherefore, take heed, brethren. We have to be careful because the deceitfulness of our own heart even wants to pull those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ away. And rather than heeding, we harden. Lord, if there are believers here this morning who have walked far from God, I pray that today would be the day that they place Christ back in that preeminent position. They would come and pray. That they would kneel. That they would understand who Jesus Christ is. And wholly surrender to Him. Certainly, Lord, if there's an unbeliever in our midst this morning, one that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, may they act quickly, even now. 
with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The questions are simple. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you can answer yes to that this morning, would you raise your hand? Yes, I have asked Jesus to save me from my sins. Praise the Lord. So many of you across the house, you may put your hands down. Thank you. Would there be one today that says, you know, Kyle, would you pray for me? Because I have not made that decision yet. I have not asked Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. Is there one that would say, before God and me, no one else is looking around this morning, just me. Kyle, I need to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior today. Is there one? So I will make the petition then on the second question to believe. Is Christ preeminent in your life? We're told to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Verse 1. He's brought the divine message of redemption, and we all in this place and this day presently say we've accepted that message. As a high priest, when he goes back in before God with his own shed blood, as our advocate before the Father, what is he saying about your life? What is true of your actions this week? Do they honor God? Do they show that you love Jesus? Or do they show that you love yourself? Perhaps this morning you're sitting here and you've been through a long period of life where you've been hardening your heart. Oh, you're saved. Friend, trust me, I know where you are. There was a long period of my life where I was far from God, and my heart was quite hard towards the things of God. But the only way you overcome a hard heart is by heeding the call to repentance today. Pastor, will it be magically better? No, but it'll be markedly better. God, forgive me for my hardness. God, forgive me for my provocation. God, forgive me for my stubbornness. Now, today, while it is today, I will heed what your word says. I repent and I ask you to forgive me. That's not salvation again. That is the process of sanctification. If that's what you need to do, in just a moment we'll stand. You can come and pray. You can kneel at your seat. But I encourage you to act in faith towards God. Father, bless our thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed. A verse or two more is all we'll have for the invitation this morning. I could have your attention just before we close in a word of prayer this morning. If Chelsea Elliott has come, uh, Jessica, I called her Chelsea down there. Chelsea's already come. She's sitting back there going, wait, I've already come. Jessica Elliott has come. Your sister came, and Jessica came before Chelsea knew she was coming up to join the church a couple weeks back, and she said, sis, you ratted me out. You left me sitting over here. So, Jessica, that's easy to remember. That's my wife now. I'll keep it straight now. Um, Jessica has come to join the church. Jessica, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you followed the Lord and believed his baptism after that salvation? Praise the Lord. She said yes to both of those. If you will come up and greet Jessica. You can, is Chelsea here this morning? All right, so good. Mom and Dad are here, but uh, you can't greet anybody else. Just greet Jessica and tell her how glad you are that she's joined the church. All those in favor of receiving her, come transfer a letter. Let it be known by a hearty amen. Amen. We're excited for you. We're glad you're here and part of the church family. Zach, will you come and close us in a word of prayer this morning? And we will be dismissed. Hope you'll be back tonight. Shane's got... Lesson number two.
when we started these lessons, we didn't know. They are BBB, not Build Back Better. They are Build Below the Baseline is the title of these, but it was a wonderful thing to figure out. So Shane's got tonight. I hope you can be back at 5 o'clock for that and for our Sunday school hour as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for this time that we can gather around your word. Uh, I pray that we would leave here uh, more unified together and more closely drawn to you. I pray that you would help us in all things that we do to keep you preeminent, help us to keep you in the right position so that we can live in the fullness of the life that you uh, provided for us. I pray that we would take full advantage of that uh, and that we would live lives that are honoring and glorifying to you. Uh, be with us as we depart. I pray you bring us back again this evening. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you.